Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Resilient Mind with Andrew and Steve. My name is Steve Nathanson. I'm here with my good friend, Andrew Marangoni. How are you doing today, Andrew? Fantastic. It's a beautiful morning today. It is a beautiful morning. I'm really excited for it, actually. It's nice and warm and sunny. Greatly looking forward to this conversation as well. And to that, we actually have a guest today, Joe Bauer. And so I'm going to give Joe an opportunity to introduce herself. So, Joe, if you wouldn't mind, we'd love to... Hello, I'm Joe. I am a family nurse practitioner. I did that for many, many years and realized that most of what I was doing was mental health support because you have to really be able to care for yourself before you can actually care for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go into just doing that and being able to give people my full attention in that regard. So I started Steel and Flora Wellness to do some integrative psychiatry work. So I do write prescriptions, it's a great tool, but I also am a certified tiny habits coach um, so that I can work on the, instead of telling people, right, have you ever been to the doctor? And they're just like, go exercise. And you're like, okay, well, I, I already knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I can actually try to help people make it happen instead of just basically shaming people, you know, 23 people a day and then kicking them out, which is yeah. primary care. Right, no, I, I totally relate. Because that's what I feel my industry is like, too, is like it's well, we have we know all the problems and what to do about it. So what what's your daily practice look like? What are those hurdles like? What are the little steps of getting a little bit of momentum going um, and giving people actual support there instead of judgment, criticism and like what you don't know this because um, that's not helpful. No, it doesn't feel good. And it doesn't when you don't feel good, you can't do anything. You just end up feeling more shame and then you avoid the situation because you don't like it. Yeah. It's not helpful. Yeah. So actually, I'm curious about that. Would you mind sharing a little bit more on how you do that and the tiny habits you mentioned? Yeah. So tiny habits uh, is basically, I call it dog training for humans. So I found it through actually through lima beans um, because of the positive reinforcement stuff that I, so I have two dogs and I love training them. It's really fun. And I love, and they're both rescue dogs. So I love kind of working through their journey of comfort. Um, and I got really curious about how you could give a human a cookie after they do something good. Like, so how do we do that? And I stumbled across tiny habits and the, I, the cookie is celebration. Hmm. So at something very portable. You don't have to carry Skittles around because that's experimented with that once. I just ate all the Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> but you just give yourself a dopamine hit by doing whatever feels natural to you as a celebration. So I sort of like to play with it when people are really depressed or they're really cynical about it, which is like, you know, 90% of the people <laughs> I work with of just sort of silly ones where you can kind of like resentfully pat yourself on the back or like totally straight face, like good job. But it's yeah. a sport, right? Like it's just this little move towards feeling better. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Celebrating the shine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I know you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's nice because you're you're more curious if you find this as well. Cause I find a lot of people disqualify the positive when we talk about mentalities and experiences that they have and maybe don't give themselves enough credit as well. Oh, that's just me, right? That's just who I am. I, I don't deserve a, a cookie for doing that because I just do it naturally. We disqualify that positive. We don't embrace maybe what does deserve perhaps that recognition. So I really like that idea that the positive reinforcement side of it, building that, like you said, that dopamine hit something we all naturally crave and right? social media feeds off of, media feeds off of. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm curious, actually, do you find something similar in your work where a lot of people perhaps do disqualify positives in their lives uh, or don't give themselves enough credit? Yeah, that's basically a constant. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of what I do uh, ends up being working with marginalized people. Mm -hmm. And so people who've, the world around us tells us we're not, we're like, our bodies are a little bit less valuable. Our lives are a little bit less valuable. Um, and and then there is, you know, statistically more likely to ha have a trauma in the background because, you know, if your parents also are being told they're less valuable or immigration is, 
challenging and a hot mess. There's just, you know, so many reasons for people to have a really hard time. And then, but because that's your reality, you just are like, well, this is normal, right? So like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, and then I, and then, I, but I don't know why I'm having migraines. I don't know why my stomach hurts all the time or I'm so exhausted. And so a lot of what I do is say, of course, of course you feel like crap, right? Like, why would you not? This is very real and you're just so used to it, but this is hard and you are doing a good job and you're being a human being. You're not just being a human being, right? You're being a mammal. This is what I like about the like integrating multiple species is it's not because otherwise people really believe it's a weakness that they can't do the thing, whatever the thing is. And it's not, it's just neurobiology. Yeah. Is that the main thing you find people struggle with? Or is there some other kind of main thing that you find you help people build resilience around? Well, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, you have to believe that you're worth taking care of. Yeah. So yeah, that's the first step towards anything else that that I might do. Yeah. Helping them recognize that it's okay to be who they are is what I take away from that, if that's fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's okay to be pissed, right? It's okay to be sad. Yeah. We don't give ourselves space to be like, to feel the feelings about the things that are frustrating or infuriating or unfair. And, you know, like if you need to go throw glass against a wall in the space where it's not hurting anybody and you can clean it up, you know, just like let her rip, you should be mad and that's okay. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I say this all the time to my, my clients, when we had this kind of conversation, I say, you're, you're probably, they're not going to hear this anywhere else, but like, it's okay to be upset. And so yeah. I am thrilled <laughs> to meet somebody that I can have that conversation with who's also preaches the exact same thing, right? It's okay to have all the feels, the full range of emotions, because that's who we are. And that's okay. It's a part of us. And, and I apologize if I'm taking us down a tangent, but I feel like when we work against that, and we believe that we shouldn't be that way, or we shouldn't get upset, or we shouldn't, you know, yell or scream or throw glass against the wall, we get upset now for a compounded reason, because we're upset in the first place. And now we're uh, angry at ourselves because we think we shouldn't be a certain way. And I feel like we fight against ourselves constantly in that instead of embracing that it is part of who we are. Cause once we do accept that, I feel it's easier to then say, you know what? Yeah. I don't need to throw that glass against the wall today, or that's okay that I just got really frustrated, but I don't have to let that consume me. Right. Right. And, and, you can do something about it. You can't do anything about it if you don't let yourself have the feeling. So yeah. the thing that I'm reminded of constantly in the animal world is watching you know, the dogs encounter something that gives them lots of feelings of any kind, bad or good. And then, you know, 30 seconds down the road, they shake it off <laughs> and then they're fine. But humans, we don't, we can't shake it off, right? We don't have permission in the bank when somebody's making us mad to like go nuts. Right. So the only permission that we have is to just sort of, you know, that freeze response yeah. and that just accumulates over time. And that, I think that's a lot of what makes people sick. So I got one of the, the reasons, one of the reasons why I wanted to do the work that I do now is because there is no pill for that. Wish there was. Yeah. You're right. There is no pill for that. And having feelings is important and being in touch with them. And I love what you're saying too, about like allowing the dogs to like get to the point where they get to a point where they can shake it off and let it go. Cause they don't hold on to it. They don't hold on to it. Like we do. Um, human beings, they, they just keep shoving it down there. <laughs> um, and you know, we do the same things to our dogs. Like when a lot of people when they're out in their own society, when their dogs are having feelings, they're like, don't have feelings. That's embarrassing. I don't want to have feelings about your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> <a lot>. um, <laughs> right. So like, it's just this constant shoving down. And like, if, when you do that, the dog experiences the same thing when you shut down their emotions is yeah. like, it becomes toxic inside. Like you, you need to let those things out. 
And like, I think the important thing is, is it, it's tough for people, but it's very tough to teach dogs like how to cope with their emotions. But there are ways of doing it, just like there are ways of doing it for humans. And a lot of times it's just removing yourself from the situation a little bit, taking a few deep breaths and just letting the, the, the emotions pass. That happened, you know, and then don't create a crazy story around it to just drive yourself down. <laughs> Yeah, we do we do that? We create all these stories about how terrible we are. We don't really create a lot of stories about how great we are. That would might that might be a little bit more helpful sometimes. Right. And then even if we did, we'd be like, oh, now I'm a narcissist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like we can't win. But there's a lot of truth to that because we do have an easier time in this world characterizing right the negatives the things we don't like the things that we don't want what's wrong what's bad very problem focused versus you know uplifting mm -hmm. and we don't have a lot of influences i think in our current society at least in this country that allow us the freedom to break out of that because drama sells tv right. movies We've talked about this multiple times, actually, in the past couple episodes of, of social media and the influence it has because of what it presumably shows us to be true in reality. So I think there's a very valid point in there. And affirmations is a really easy thing to do. It's hard for people to embrace it. I feel, though, I am powerful. I am confident. I am capable. They're easy statements to put out there. They're hard to believe. So I'm, I'm actually curious as we're talking about the subject, do you do affirmation work with your clients or anything similar to that to help them embrace the positives? I don't. And that's, I mean, that's an interesting thing that I'll have to think about doing. I think maybe that's my own personal bias mm -hmm. is being like an extreme cynic and like being part of the problem, right? It's like, I don't like my feelings. <laughs> and if somebody told me to do affirmations, I'd be like, get out of here. Although <laughs> I... I think if they told me I could include swear words, I would be maybe better at it. So I, maybe I, <laughs> I could try that. Yeah. Well, it's fair. And, and that's, that's the beauty is we're all, we're all different. Something different works for, for each and every single one of us. So actually, let me kind of flip it on its head and ask you that question is, how do you typically find you help your clients embrace the positives? Um... by keeping them under threshold, as they say, <laughs> the training world. And that's really hard because people want to push themselves beyond where they're comfortable. So, I mean, the first thing is, right, is medicine. That's not the, it's not the first thing as far as fundamentally, but it's the easiest thing is mm -hmm. saying, yeah. let's just see if we can get your neurochemistry to a place where you can start to do some of these behaviors. And then, um, and then saying like, okay, don't try. I know I should meditate, I'm so bad. Okay, don't try to meditate for 10 minutes. Uh, can you close your eyes and take one deep breath yep. when you get up in the morning and just start it? And they're like, well, that's just, you know, obviously I could do that, that's so easy. But then it's not, right? Because otherwise we'd be doing it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. very slow. Yeah, it's those micro steps, right? The tiny habits you were talking about, this one small step at a time is the way that I, I typically characterize that because to your point, not everyone is going to get the same thing out of meditation. Right. Not everybody needs the meditation. Maybe it is. I just need it. <sighs> All right. I'm good. And let it go. And so well, I, I oh, go ahead. I, so I'm, <laughs> that made me laugh because so you use affirmations a lot and I use mindfulness a lot. So yeah. probably if you, if me saying like, well, I don't know, affirmations give me a stomach ache. Um, I don't think everybody needs them, but I do think everybody needs to practice some kind of mindfulness because there's yep. all sorts of evidence around it, but then maybe you're right. You're blowing my mind, right? Like maybe not everybody needs that, but I live in a world where everybody needs it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a great point. And so something maybe to bring up for our listeners as well, because this is a confusing topic I find for a lot of folks is meditation is a kind of mindfulness, but not all mindfulness is meditation. So there's many different ways to be mindful that isn't just sitting there in that meditative state. So that's one of the most popular ways I, I feel to be mindful, but it's not the only way. 
True story. Yeah. yeah. It's hard for a lot of people to sit still. So if you can just take a minute to notice things on the move, it's also good. Yeah. 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 I, <clears throat> I sometimes think it's as simple as closing your eyes and, you know, describing yourself like, what do I feel right now? Do I feel the sun hitting me? Do I feel, feel a breeze? What do I hear? What do I feel? You know, and just be in that moment, just kind of connected to what you're experiencing, not being shrouded by the consuming thoughts of your psychological assessment all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's a great, it's a great, great point, Andrew, because we've, you know, I talk about this a lot, right? It start, starts with us first. Can I bring that awareness into me first and just embrace how am I feeling? Am I off? Am I clicking on all cylinders and I think I can tackle everything that I'm facing? Or it's like, you know what? I just got back from vacation. I'm very sluggish. I'm not like fully there at the moment and that's okay. I can take it slower today. You know, whatever that may be, just that recognition internally, not only my external senses, but my internal senses of how I'm feeling. And, and you brought up headaches and, and stomach aches, Joe, earlier too. Those are great things to talk about, I think, in terms of our internal senses. What is that telling me? And then can I be mindful of that and then allow that to help guide the way that I'm going to behave in this moment or this conversation with people? And once I've mastered that, then I can start extending that to, to other people as well. Yeah, that's the dream, right? To be able to do that. It's such a challenge. Yeah, it's but very, well, very doable. Very doable. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And once it's doable and you start practicing is then also being grateful for that practice and staying with it. Like once you start feeling the, re the results of that is don't forget that you got here in small little steps. Right. And even if you get away from your practices, this is just, it's not the end. Like you're not done. You just need to get back. Yeah. Um, you know, I go with that through clients all the time with dog training is like, again, you don't need more information. You need to stay, take steps back in your practice and restart for where you were successful last, <laughs> you know, just because you aren't where you want to go. doesn't mean you stop practicing. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Every time I think about um, it's so much easier for me to conceptualize all these things in the dog training world. It's so helpful then to bring it back. So you know, every time I, there's one time my dog has one of them, one of them has really good recall. And then he didn't have really good recall. And I was like, oh, maybe I need like a vibration collar to be like, hey, listen, dude. And then I was like, no, Bauer, calm down. Like, you know what you need to do. You just haven't practiced in a long time. So you're going to get closer. You're going to use higher value rewards and you're just going to start from scratch. And now it's, you know, now it's back. He, he knows what to do, but that, you're right. This is the same thing we need to do for ourselves is just be like, it's fine. Like, don't kick yourself. Don't be aversive to yourself. Just take a step back. You know that you've done it before and do it again. Yeah. And you hit the nail on the head so beautifully, Joe, because we often forget about that in the moment we get blinders on, right? And we forget about everything that we've done before and that we're truly capable of doing it again. Maybe it's a slightly different scenario, but what's made me successful in that past can make me successful again here. So just quick aside on that, I think uh, we don't give ourselves enough credit for what we have achieved in life and we often forget about it in the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious actually, what other, what other typical commonalities maybe do you find with your, with your clients? Commonalities, other commonalities. I think my world, I'm just so used to what it is that it's hard for me to describe. <laughs> Doesn't everybody have, you know, incredible trauma in their background? Um, I think unprocessed trauma is the big thing that I, that I work with. A lot of people struggle with attention because, and they ask about attention deficit disorder, um, but really you can't focus if you, are worried about everything that happens in the future, everything that happened in the past, your mind is not in the present. So why would you remember anything? Like, why wouldn't you be spacey? And if you, you know, if you, if you in the past had to just be really wary of what's happening in the world around you, your brain is busy now, yeah. like the habit that it formed. So, you know, obviously 
it's serious if somebody is struggling with attention, but is that the, is that the root, is that the disorder? Most of the time, no. But again, you're right, people don't give themselves credit. They're yeah. like, must be something wrong with me. Not, I have a, a physiologic reason for this happening that is perfectly rational. Yeah. Actually, this is a quick question because a lot of people, when this topic comes up, I think say, oh, I have ADHD, right? How, this may be putting you on the spot and maybe an unknown and that's completely okay. How many people perhaps believe that they have say ADHD, but actually don't, and maybe it's something else or they just are convincing themselves maybe that they are not capable of paying attention or focusing to the extent that they want. Therefore, it must be this, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I, so I take a slightly different approach. Okay. I like to just throw out, <laughs> gonna sound funny. I like to just throw out the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual okay. because it's just, a, it's just created by really a bunch of like old white cis straight men who were like got together and they're like, oh, like this is what's wrong with like these people. And, and it's really helpful for insurance reimbursement and it's helpful when you need um, to get, you know, like disability, you have to categorize things for those reasons. But when it comes down to something like I can't pay attention, I think it's true. I don't think people are convincing themselves that they can't, but I don't know that it's necessarily the reason is that they have that particular biology of attention deficit disorder. I yeah. think a lot of people have a different biological reason and functionally it may end up being the same, but when you're looking at how to make it better, then maybe, maybe it's not stimulants, right? Maybe, or maybe it is a little bit, but while you're working on, you know, your trauma-informed approach, finding somebody who can help you with EMDR and other things like that. Yeah, and thank you, because I appreciate you greatly fielding that question, because I think to your point, we can be very self-prescriptive, if you will, today, because there is a lot out there and, sometimes we do kind of like buckets or framework, right? It's easier for us to kind of process things that are bucketed or framework, but it's not always the thing that actually helps us figure out, well, what is right? Where does it come from, right? Am I being forced into something that's not truly right for me? So I actually really greatly appreciate the answer that you had to that question, because I think it can be very helpful for us to hear what is really at the root of maybe that does draw my focus away. Mm -hmm. is it something neurologically there is it something biological is it something different am I not giving myself enough credit for what I am doing and I'm expecting more of myself you know I, right. I think there's a lot of different potential reasons that could be there so I think it's a great kind of approach of well, let's figure out what really is here before we start kind of presuming right something is is wrong with me if that makes sense yeah, it makes total sense. And what you said kind of reminded me of a funny thing that happens. So in, a lot of times if I give somebody who can't focus a stimulant and then they can focus better, they forget how bad it was in the beginning. And so they're like, oh, I'm not perfect now. I'm not a machine. And they're like, I need more. And I have to be like, well, remember how you were a hot mess uh, six months ago? Yeah. <laughs> this is better. This is like as good as it gets. We're all just like, a less less of a hot mess if we're functional it's just a matter of degree <laughs> yeah yeah <clears throat> no i've said that to lots of people is that like every human being on the planet is you know a level of hot mess some people <laughs> some people's hot mess looks like success to others you know what i mean mm -hmm. but like you know elon musk is running around bumming it on people's couches like you know like <laughs> In my mind, that's a hot mess. Like you're the richest dude in the plan. You don't have any security. <laughs> like, like you don't have a home route. You know what I mean? Like it's a hot mess to me. You know what I mean? But other people, it's success. Who knows? I, I think one of the things about what we're talking about here with distractibility is that the world has become increasingly complex in the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and it's multiplying by 
factions that we haven't really had to deal with. Um, and they just keep adding more and more work on to us and that when they're normalizing it. And yeah, you know, no wonder everyone's distracted and, and tired because we don't know what to expect. We don't know what to do. Everything's gonna change tomorrow anyway. You know, <laughs> like I just learned this software Well, we're changing it tomorrow to the new update and it's completely different. Yeah, right. <laughs> like <laughs> how are how are we supposed to feel not distracted? Right. And like the same thing goes is like with the self-diagnostic thing is <clears throat> every person I talk to thinks their dog has separation anxiety. But yeah. like sep separation anxiety is a like a really clinical. There are a lot of symptoms that you have to kind of tie down to it. It's not just like the dog whines in a crate. I was like, well, yeah, and put any being in a cage just in a protest. <laughs> um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it has this, you know, detrimental psychological disorder about being separated from you. Same thing is just like, if you can't concentrate and maybe sometimes you get a little down on yourself and then you get a little hyper every once in a while, doesn't mean you have ADHD. You might have some similar symptoms, but I also think that a lot of ADHD symptoms are just the symptoms of modern society is there's a lot going on and it's really hard for us to navigate all that. And, you know, we, there's whole, whole careers being made on just helping people navigate the world. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. You know, and maybe, maybe it's a good time actually to, to dig into that a little bit. So with my folks in the corporate sector specifically, here's kind of what creates that ADHD, I feel. Is, um, I've got my phone, I've got Slack, I've got email, I've got uh, maybe an office phone. So there's always something coming in and they often feel like they can't focus because they're being pulled in so many different directions. Or I have to answer this, I have to get to this, or this fire drill just came up, right? So now there's work and there's email. I don't even know if I mentioned that earlier <laughs> in there there's a lot of different means for people to get in touch with us to do exactly what you're talking about, Andrew, right? It's just give us more, put more on our plate or cause us to feel like we have to take on what's presented to us right then and there. So I can't get to what I've already planned. So there's a lot of things already in our working lives that create that type of distraction. And then I think with on demand, with Amazon, with all the different streaming services that we have, there's an abundance there that also makes it difficult because there's always something to look at. There's always something to scroll to on social media, something to watch on YouTube. And then I could sit there for an hour trying to figure out what to watch because there's too much content out there as well. So I feel like to your point, right, we've kind of groomed ourselves today to feel like we can't focus because there's so many different things that do draw our attention away from what we want to achieve or make it harder to make that decision. Yeah, I use that Netflix paradox, all, <clears throat> excuse me, all the time, is that like, because of the abundance of content, and if you look at it the same way, is like the life has so many options now, you can yeah. create yourself however you want, right? But same paradox goes is that you may end up spending more time looking for something to do than doing anything. <laughs> right you're spending all this time like in your head is like what would make me so great and what would what's going to make my life perfect and you're looking and you're searching and you're looking and you're not doing anything mm -hmm. and then you feel the emptiness and you're like what's wrong with me <laughs> so you you're you're not you're not being able to hone in on what you want and I think that's why like tapping into vision and like talking about what is it that you want in your life and what, what do you want to practice and getting back into that whole thing is like, if you want mindfulness, then you have to practice mindfulness in your day-to-day -day life. Um, you know, yeah. we don't get that, but like you guys were talking about social media, it just gives you the final product. It doesn't, right. they don't give you like the messy interim steps or, or the backward steps that are totally natural. They just give you this final product that has a really beautiful filter on it. And we're, and we're like, I'm failing because I haven't, I haven't magically instantly achieved that, which is insane, right? Why would we be able to do that? And if you say that to people, they're like, yeah, I guess, I guess that makes sense. But our, 
our emotional self as you're scrolling is like, well, I'm bad at this. I don't have that. <laughs> this is really, I should be able to do it right now. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many good points in there is number one, change is not hundred percent linear. The trend may be linear, but we're going to take lots of steps backwards. We're going to take a spiral or some funky road to get there because it doesn't look like an absolute straight line. But as long as our trend is continuing forward and moving linearly, that's what we're looking for. You could draw that trend line in that squiggle however we want. And that's the way that we change. And we change over time, right? Not instantaneously to your point, even though two degrees, again, good timing on his part. Uh, it takes hard work and dedication to get to where we want to go. And we see a lot of final product, as you said, right on social media or even in, in athletics, because that's a big favorite world of mine. Yeah. Why can't I get out there and run a two hour and four minute marathon, right? That is a world-class marathon time. Why can't I do that? I'm not, I'm failing because I can't do that. Number one, right? There's, not a whole lot of people in this world who can run that kind of time, but they certainly could not do that on their first go. They had to build years of practice to be able to run, you know, four something minute miles for 26 miles. And we often forget that because we see that final product. And even if we're at different, say, competitive levels athletically, we still do that. I still look ahead of me and go, I'm not at this place on my bike for my triathlons. And I know I've got years left to go and I can get there, but I've got to dedicate that time to, to get there. We just forget and then we get down on ourselves because we're not there right away. And then if you don't get there, I think what we don't get told is, is that's you're enough. Like yeah. you, you are enough as a human being at every step of the way. And if you set a goal and then you, don't get there it doesn't it loses its meaning you lose its yeah. motivation you get hurt whatever you're still enough you're still valuable it's not like I, I always picture that nike world like just do it right you should hurt yourself more you should put your push yourself harder and until you get to that like very glossy finish you don't you don't count of course you count that's silly yeah yeah uh I, I, you know there's a great there's a great lesson in that is we don't tell ourselves that we are enough, enough. <laughs> we, we really don't because we're always looking, I think, externally or outwards to, to others. And social comparison is a very natural thing that we do to others, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Joe's incredibly successful and confident. Why can't I be like her? Andrew is incredible with his dogs. Why can't I be that way? Why, is, why are Layla and Jude still giving me, you know, difficulty, let's say? <laughs> we tend to compare ourselves to others and I think create that perception that we're not enough because we're putting this assumption on how others are and we are not. Agreed. So you heard it here first, you are enough. Well, if you are enough. Honestly, if there's one thing I want people to walk away from today with it is, is that I think that's an incredibly powerful thing is you are enough uh, being who you are and we are happy that you are that way and that you are who you are and it's okay to, to be that person. It's the thing that like a par like parents might say to their kids, like you think about it as a childish thing um, to say that not everybody, if everybody was the same, the world would be boring, yeah. right? But I don't think we internalize that. If everybody could run that two hour marathon, like who would be around to do, I don't know, pick some fruit. Yeah. Everybody right. would be <laughs> Because like people don't think about that stuff too, is like all gain takes sacrifice. And like, you know, people who are excelling at very high levels in certain areas probably have deficits in other areas of their life. You know, it's very hard to do it all. Um, you know, and that's the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the more successful you are, the more people you probably have hired to support you in your success. Like <laughs> those, those people are not doing it alone. <laughs> I'll have a nanny. I guarantee you every single one of them has a nanny and a dog walker and like they have staff. 
they have people they can afford. Their staff has staff. Right? Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> to that point, though, it's okay to get help. It's okay to ask for help, right? We don't necessarily do that enough and say, you know what? I do need help. That first part is hard enough as it is, let alone asking someone for that help. Agreed. Yeah. We, in my, in my household, um, we both, so I'm gay, so I live with another woman. And we're both socialized to feel like we should be able to care for the home, right? So we should be able to clean the house. But we're also <laughs> both healthcare providers and we're crazy busy and exhausted. Yeah all the time so the house used to be a a huge mess and we would fight about it all the time and at some point I was like I think I want to pay somebody to clean this house <laughs> just every other week and Hannah was like we do not need to pay somebody to do something we are perfectly capable of doing and I was like I just can't like I'm calling it I can't do it <laughs> and it oh my god it changed our lives we we're so we had such an easier time just coming home getting along all these things, just a little, a little help with yeah. the basic thing. Yeah, a little help can go a long, a long way, relieving stress that we feel, anxiety that we feel, and it's okay to ask for that help. Yeah, people like to help. It makes them feel important. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, <clears throat> I love when people ask me for help. I mean, my whole business is me helping people, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, or supporting them because they're, they're all capable. Um, right. So it, it is, it is me supporting them in what they are trying to do. Yeah. Um, and then there are times where help is, you know what, my schedule is so busy. I just need you to do this for me and I will compensate you for that. <laughs> yeah. no, I feel you with the house cleaning thing like my girlfriend and I are both very busy and we had that same conversation it was like let's just hire a house cleaner and then you know we don't have to argue about it right and Carmen's not mad that I pay her right so like everybody wins in this situation <laughs> yeah. we we brought up a number of different really good points here I think and I'm I'm curious if they feed into maybe the image or the trans the image of the world you want to live in mm -hmm. and so one of the questions we like to actually ask on this show is what kind of transformative world do you want to live in and i think we've hit a lot of the elements but i'm, I'm curious to hear what you would say to that question it's magic one time <laughs> I, 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 I can't with the magic wand so crazy to imagine um but I mean, obviously, right, and global warming, et cetera. But yeah. outside of that, I would love to ha have a superpower where I could make everybody more curious, just mm -hmm. like, could we be more curious about each other's stories, about our own stories? Because I think right now we're all very kind of quick to judge. And that may be a stress response and it might be understandable, but it's also not very helpful socially in the long run. So if we could just be more curious about other people's responses, that would be incredible. Yeah. Yep. Imagine how many conversations we could have if we were more curious and what those conversations could lead to. Yeah, especially with the expectation of other people being curious, because I think one of the things that kills most of our curiosity is, will this curiosity be well recepted? Mm. <laughs> Um, that's yeah, that's, that's one of the better answers I've heard. I think <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fair though, because it, it gets to really the core of what can help us start to have certain conversations that we need to have and we typically avoid and the magic that can come from just starting those conversations and what that can lead to in terms of understanding and acceptance and then what that can launch. And so, knowing uh, that we're similar to other people. So if you have a conversation with somebody and just be curious about each other, right? You just have this conversation, yeah. you find commonality with people who are really different from you, really different, who you think you would absolutely, you, like not, you might get in a fist fight. I don't know how to fight, but 
like I would think maybe I would. <laughs> <laughs> but if you know, I one of the one of the amazing things about being a healthcare provider is you have this sort of rapid the honor of this really rapid intimacy with people. So I've had a lot of pretty intense conversations with thousands. I mean, it's crazy to say this, but I did the math, like thousands of people. Yeah. Um, and really has helped me learn how much we're all, we're all worried about being enough, right? We're all worried about all this stuff that we had just talked about, even when we're totally ostensibly different. Yeah. And that's the secret to what binds us together is that human experience and the fact that it's all up here. A lot of it starts with what's in our minds and the commonalities to your point. It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, where you're from, all of that taken away. We all really struggle with the exact same things up here in our minds. And it's kind of amazing to me that that's there and we don't give our enough credit <laughs> back to part of our earlier conversation that we are all very similar in that regard of being human or being mammals as you said yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i like i like to think about it as like electrical grid right is like we're we're all connected through electricity is like it's there but <clears throat> whether you are in the on or off position is dependent on the connection you make um and curiosity is the on position i would say um and that allows you to you know have connectivity with others and <clears throat> look across maybe party lines or you know yeah. looking at your arch rival as somebody else you still value as a human being um <laughs> right is we're opponents, but I still value your worthiness as a human being. Yeah, yeah it's hard. We're not really taught to hold both those things at the same time. And it's no, so it's tough. Yeah. yeah, it's important. Um, and yeah, we'll find connectivity with, with pretty much anyone. And I think the thing that we have to realize is that just because that you find some commonality doesn't mean that that automatically ties you to some crazy view they have. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like i can i can understand your feelings about that but i don't agree with that one view but that's all right i still enjoy talking to you and you know but you know doesn't mean i have to cancel you doesn't mean that we don't ever have to talk again doesn't mean i have to put you in the ground <laughs> i think it would change i think it changes our our sense of who our community is and there's all sorts of research and philosophy around what how our behavior changes depending on how we view who is our community so if we get curious about people that are different the community expands we feel more like we need to care for everybody else that we're similar to and not just you know our friends yeah so speaking of that actually in expanding the community and connection how do people reach you joe if they want Ooh. to get in touch with you Look at that segue. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> so my website is steelandflora.com. S T E E. What? How many E's are there? Did I just say two E's? Steel, like the metal, and flora. F L O R A. dot com. And I am occasionally on the gram, although I don't like it because of all the things we talk about social media. <laughs> so I'm like forcing myself to do it because you're supposed to do it. Um, but Steel and Flora Wellness is on Instagram. Excellent. Yeah. So steelandflora.com or on Instagram at Steel and Flora Wellness. Is yes. that the right hand? Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Let me write that story about social media, Joe. Is it's just a neutral thing and you can use it to create whatever you want. Sure. <clears throat> you know, you don't have to don't have to be on there but if you choose to be on there what 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 message are you going to give to the audience well, like what support are you going to lend through your ig yeah that i mean i guess that's kind of what i'm still trying to figure out so that it feels meaningful um and my current idea is because the thing i like about instagram is finding new ideas right so um trying to 
follow the story. So I have this dog named Billy, who's a rescue dog. I got her at six months old. She was the one dog curled up in the back of her crate. She's definitely like biologically an anxious dog. And she's, you know, had been through three shelters, you know, she's, she's has a really hard time. So I'm wondering if maybe I can turn it into sort of following her journey of finding wellness, because she has, we have had a journey together, and it continues. Um, and that intersection of, of the dog mammal, or other mammals, and the human mammal. I'm kind of going that way. Yeah, that's a long answer, but that's what I've been thinking. Oh, I, I like it. I love that. Yeah. Is, you know, there are lots of parallels, right? Is the like the story you write about your dog's reactivity or your dog's history of why they are that way. Um, or I see it this way all the time is like people with Malamas is like they have this idea that this dog's a monster and it needs to be controlled. And I was like, well, you know, maybe it's the the narration of treating the dog like a monster that's creating its behavior to be monsterish, <laughs> right? Like if you treat the dog like just any other dog, is it, does it behave differently? Yes, yeah. yes, it does. Cause I love that <laughs> <laughs> But you know, again, <clears throat> there's so much to say about it. Bio biologically, it is a very sound, well put together dog. She has a great brain. She doesn't have brain chemistry problems. Like that is something that isn't talked about that much is that, you know, we don't have control over the chemicals on our body and our brain. And when we can understand how to manipulate that with support from medication, it can lend to coping mech like e easier ways of being and, and getting into different mindsets and things of that nature. So it's, it's interesting, the parallels that you can see and just like, deconstructing a little bit. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your dog. You're just beings experiencing things and people are writing stories about what you're experiencing and how you feel about those stories is really what's getting you all jammed up. And, and curiosity too, right? That applies to the animals, not- this What's going on with the animal? Not just like, stop doing the thing that drives me crazy. Why is my super high drive dog running around in circles and chewing things? I don't know, <laughs> maybe they're bored. But maybe they're not, maybe they're nervous, who knows? Let's ask the dog. Yes. That sounds cheesy, but I mean it in a more scientific practicing kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's part, of, part of the conversation I feel because you know, there's many different things, right? That could cause the dog to be running around, to be anxious or to be say tearing up the couch. For, for me, I'm a visual owner. And I exercise my vishlas very well, but I know other vishla owners have issues with them tearing up furniture because vishlas are high energy dogs. They're highly intelligent dogs as well. And they need fuel for their brains. They need fuel for their bodies. And if you don't play into that, then you can have the dog be destructive like other dogs can be. What we say, why are you doing that? You shouldn't destroy that couch. Well, are you fulfilling your dog's fundamental needs? You know, it's, it's kind of a question, right? Uh, are we curious enough to ask those questions? I've been thinking about uh, enrichment for humans because I always think about what's the parallel in the human world. So uh, obviously, if you don't exercise your dog, they're not going to feel good. You don't exercise a human, they're not going to feel good. Mm -hmm our minds aren't engaged in something that we do naturally, maybe that's what it is. Because dogs need to do things they do naturally, right? They need to chew, they need to sniff. So what's our human equivalent? I don't know, maybe it's different individually, but if we're not doing the thing that we do naturally, that's when our brain probably relaxes. Hi dog, you're so cute. <laughs> she, knew, she knew you were that, talking. That is right a her. very, very interesting question and it is kind of complex because when we think about enrichment for dogs it's like supplementing what would be natural to them if they weren't living an unnatural life with us mm -hmm. right but our lives does that mean our lives are unnatural for us too i think they are i, I think right is like were we meant to live this way or did we just trick ourselves into doing it? And, you know, if we were to get back to nature, what would that look like? You know, right. or would is enrichment wordle? I don't know. 
Where's <laughs> enrichment what? I want to know. What did you say? Huh? Where's enrichment what? Wordle. Wordle? <laughs> Wordle. The, 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 the little mind game where you try to guess the word. Oh. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I super don't play those games that I get so mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <coughs> But enrichment for humans, I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think the Obvious. potential answer to that question could be not to get too theoretical on people, so I apologize for that. But if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like an, an easy pyramid of, of needs, there's a lot of stuff that's characterized as self-actualization. That stuff that really kind of makes me feel like I've rewarded throughout the day you know for me i like an intellectual challenge for me i like a physical challenge so i go and do those things because i'm actually purely motivated intrinsically like to do them for the pure enjoyment of it but i get so much out of it and i think it's those things that bring me that joy that fulfillment that can help answer this question right when we take our dogs right for walks they need to go sniff they need to go through all the smells because that's who they are they need to explore uh, I do have a hunting breed, so they need to go and, and pick out all the, the, the birds or the squirrels that are around and, and lock in on them. That's what they need to really be fulfilled, right, and, and engage. And so I would maybe relate it to what are the things that do bring us the same type of fulfillment and enjoyment? What are those self-actualization needs, perhaps, that help us make us feel like we are actually fulfilled during the day? Interesting. If you find yourself chewing the couch, then you know you haven't. <laughs> then I'm gonna call you, Joe, and say, "Hey, Joe, <laughs> I think I have a problem." <laughs> yeah. But what I heard you say, Steve, is <clears throat> enrichment for humans is just finding joy. Yeah, it's a great, simple way of putting that. Thank you. I appreciate you actually helping me with that. <laughs> that was a really well done. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. I like it. Well, with that, maybe a challenge we'll throw out to our listeners is what can you do today to find a little bit of joy in your life? And I want to know what people do. Yeah. This is very suspenseful. Can you tell me if you get answers? Yeah, absolutely. And to that, if you guys want to share what you do, please just reach out to us. Uh, drop us a line here on our podcast or at the resilient mind podcast.com. We would love to hear what you are, you're doing to bring a little bit of joy into your life. Yeah. So until next time, be the movement in your life. Stay resilient.